Hello, I'm Lydia Kavraki. I'm honored to give this talk and I would like to thank the organizers of the conference for their kind invitation. I was looking very much forward to going to Paris for ICRA 2020, as I'm sure many of you did too. Unfortunately, the pandemic has changed our plans. I hope everybody stays well and stays healthy until we meet again. I'm recording this talk from Rice University in Houston, Texas. The building behind me is Duncan Hall. This is where my office is. Today, I will talk about two topics that I'm passionate about. One is motion planning, and I will focus on the role that motion planning can play for the design of autonomous systems. The word beyond in the title of this talk refers to my work in computational structure and biology. There, I use robotics-inspired techniques for adding the design of new therapeutics. The pandemic is indeed a call to action for the robotic community. It would have been great to be able to send robots to disinfect ambulances and hospitals and perform tasks that would minimize exposure of doctors and nurses to infectious agents. Our robots are making their way there. As I said before, I work in computational drug design where a primary goal is understanding how molecules interact. Molecules and molecular complexes are extraordinary efficient machines, as coronaviruses have proven to all of us. On the left, you can see a cartoon of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. One of its mechanisms of action is that its spike protein can interact, can bind with the ACE2 receptor, which can be found on the surface of human cells. And a detailed picture is shown on the right. Preventing this interaction, possibly by blocking the area of interaction with another molecule that will bind there, may hold the key to a therapeutic. Over the years in my group, we've been working on understanding how molecules change their shape to bind to receptors. Some of our methods are clearly inspired by our robotics research, and I will finish my talk with our work in that area. Let me start with robotics. This video illustrates very nicely what a highly trained astronaut does for much of the day in space, disinfecting surfaces and handrails and fetching and putting away cargo bags. Everything is stored in these cargo bags in the space station. Being in Houston and only 40 miles away from the NASA uh, Johnson Space Center, we've been inspired by their challenges. NASA is building robots that would retrieve bags for logistic purposes, and one of them is the Robonaut 2, which is shown in this picture. Cargo retrieval actually reveals all the complexities in commanding a robot to perform a mission. Let's look at this task. Remember, the robot is in zero gravity and uh, hence it uh, always needs to hold on to a handrail. Handrails are shown in blue at the bottom of the slide. So the robot needs to approach the cargo bag storage area safely hand, uh, um, while holding on to handrails. Remove the restraint of the bag, remove the bag, hold the bag, remember this is a zero gravity environment, and take it to its destination. To solve the problem, you need to solve a lot of smaller problems. Uh, you need to worry about motion planning, task and motion planning. You need to worry about perception. Of course, we cannot ignore action uncertainty and low level control, or the fact that an astronaut that is working in the same space as the robot, here in this picture, the uncontrollable agent, may interact with the robot. For all of these components, I would like to emphasize that we care about the development of techniques and that generalize. We look for general principles and solution frameworks. We want to consider the scalability, robustness, and the safety of solutions so that we can at some point see robots that can perform a variety of operations in a variety of scenarios. The generalizability of our approaches is probably the reason why it has been possible to transfer some of our work to the analysis of protein-linear interactions. At the low uh, right picture, the blue molecule is the protein, and the stick-like molecule or the robot-like molecule is the ligand that sits tightly in the cavity of that protein. This ligand is an inhibitor of STAT3 and a potential drug for cancer treatment. Of course, I do not plan to touch all these domains in my talk. Um, I will start with motion planning, then I will abstract and talk about how we use motion planning as a module in a broader context, in particular uh, for solving task and motion planning. Uh, an example of a task in motion planning is to set the table or make coffee or disinfect this room. And then I will introduce a scenario where a human is working with a robot to complete a task. 
Ocean planning, the classical problem is very well understood. We have a start, a goal, and we want to get from the start to the goal without any collisions and respecting all robot constraints. We all know this is a very difficult problem. Um, and the geometric version is very difficult. Planning, for example, for a chain of n links in 3D space is a p space complete problem. Despite this, we have a solution, we have efficient solutions today for a large, for large classes of problems. I would broadly say that we have solutions that are based on sampling. Um, there has been an explosion of sampling-based planner, planners, and I'm talking about PRM, RRT, EST, for those of you who recognize the acronyms. But we also have heuristic and discrete search methods like A star and D star light that can work very well in certain scenarios. Optimization-based based approaches have made made inroads recently, I'm talking about try and job, then jump, and also we have control theoretic methods that can be applied to this problem. It has been very interesting for me to watch what has happened with sampling-based planning, which is really the area I have worked in. I remember it was almost 25 years ago when I was here talking about sampling-based motion planners. We started with a geometric problem. The paths were just terrible and then people figured out how to do asymptotically optimal planning minimizing for example path length and this, the path started looking much better at the cost of more computation time and as we understood better how to do kinodynamic motion planning we arrived to asymptotically near optimal kinodynamic planning planners that we can use today as I said before, I've mainly worked in motion, uh, sampling-based motion planning, and I was here about, uh, I was at ICRA about 25 years ago uh, and presented the probabilistic roadmap planner or PRM. It was a very simple idea that has stood the, the test of time. The idea was, well, uh, select somehow samples configurations of the robot in the configuration space and connect these samples with short local paths. Do this many many times for many many samples, obtain a lot of connections and find out the, conne find out the connectivity of the configuration space creating a roadmap in that space. When you have a start, once you have a start and a goal, you connect the start and the goal to the roadmap and you use the roadmap in the same way Way that we are using a map to get from the start to the goal position. And uh, after um, a roadmap-based uh, uh, roadmap planners, we saw the growth of tree-based planners where uh, you can get to the goal much faster by cleverly uh, growing a tree in the configuration space of the robot. Anyone who has used these planners knows that the paths obtained by the vanilla versions can be terrible. However, the careful combination and application of these planners can yield ex impressive results. I'll show you an example. Last year, we collaborated with a group of Marc Carreras in Spain, and Edward Vital um, uh, developed a, a motion planner uh, for planning for an autonomous underwater water vehicle. The underwater domain presents several challenges and limitations. It is an unknown, unpredictable environment in which safety is paramount. The vehicle used has nonlinear dynamics and several uh, motion constraints, and importantly, limited computational resources. In this case, we only have a scanning and profiling sonar. Uh, we, what we did is that we introduced a two-layered planning uh, design. First, a fast geometric planner uh, computes a path from the start to the goal configuration. Then the lead path is used to bias the sampling of a second motion planner, an asymptotically optimal kinodynamic planner, which takes into account all the dynamics constraints. Our framework saves computational resources by generating the final trajectory only up to a finite horizon. And in this way, it is able to generate dynamically feasible trajectories while keeping the planning time low, and we can do online planning. We also impose strong safety guarantees by always allowing safety contingency maneuvers to the autonomous underwater vehicle. The bottom of these slides shows uh, several uh, trials where the planner succeeded in, in uh, uh, completing uh, the task in underwater experiments. At this point, I would like to talk about OMPL. OMPL is an open source motion planning library. Over many years, my group and several collaborators have put significant effort in creating this library. OMPL is a collection of sampling-based motion planning algorithms and can be obtained from our web page, as you can see on this slide, and its public repositories with GitHub. 
I hope that if you are in need of a motion planning algorithm, you will take the time to check OMPL. Currently, there are more than 30 different algorithms with high quality implementations in the library. My group conceived the idea of the library and its overall design. The library provides a generic abstract API for sample-based motion planning concepts and provides default implementations when possible. Several algorithms in OMPL library were implemented by us, but several were contributed by others, often by the authors of these algorithms. Because of its design, OMPL levels the fields for the comparison of sample-based algorithms, more on this a little bit later. From RISE, several people have contributed. I would like to acknowledge Mark Moll and Yuan Sukan, who were the original developers, and Zach Kickston, who has made significant contributions recently, and several other members of my group at RISE, who either contributed directly or whose work led us to the OMPL library. The success of the library, however, has come from researchers outside RISE. OMPL has currently 3,000 registered users, and the OMPL GitHub repository has been forked th about 300 times. I sincerely hope that if people who have forked the library have further additions to the library, they will contribute this back to the open source repository so that the library remains a valuable resource for the robotics community. Its connection to ROS and MoveIt, as well as several other commonly used packages, make it very easy to use the library. From GitHub, you can see that there have been sustained contributions by several people for over uh, than 10 uh, years. Um, our web pages have acknowledged these contributions. As I mentioned before, because of its design, OMPL allows the fair comparison uh, among uh, different sampling-based uh, algorithms. There are so many algorithms which one to choose. In fact, the average performance can hide large differences in variability among uh, repeated runs of a randomized algorithm. OMPL gives you the means to compare planners and understand which may be best for a specific problem domain. Actually, it's impossible to find best. Often, we want to look at several performance characteristics. Our benchmarking allows comparisons that involve running time, time to convergence for asymptotically optimal planners, and success rate, among others. We collect a lot of information during execution, which is converted to a readable database that you can upload to a visualization web uh, front end called Planner Arena. I used actually this one for all my visualization. Check it out. So I hope that you will take a look at that library. Are we done with our work in motion planning? In our group? No, we are not done. I would like to use the example of planning with manifold constraints to get to multimodal planning and from there to task and motion planning and from there to having a robot working together with a human in the rest of my talk. Uh, in general solutions for planning with manifold constraints are hard to, to obtain. This is an example of a problem where the tip of the robot needs to follow the um, light blue curve that you can see in this light. Uh, there has been a lot of work on this particular problem, but several prior works are augmentations of other planners and combine search methodology with constraint satisfaction. We've seen a lot of sampling-based motion planners in this category. This means that once you're using a particular planner, you're also bound to a particular planning strategy, which may or may not be good for the problem at hand. Satisfaction of uh, um, um, the uh, constraints can be pushed from the, planner, from the planner to the space by augmenting the space with uh, the functions that are used by sampling-based planners. This is shown in the work of Isaac Kingston, and in this way, he decoupled the sampling from the satisfaction of the constraint and allows to, allowed the, uh, us to choose the best planner for the problem ahead. So in this case, with Zach's work, one is free to choose, as I said, the sampling strategy that is most appropriate for a problem, and then the planner will take care of the constraint satisfaction. We show in our papers that this can make a huge difference, uh, even determine if you can solve a problem or not. And the theoretical results uh, uh, show that the framework preserves the probabilistic completeness and asymptotic optimality of underlying uh, sampling-based planners that are used in this particular framework. This uh, work uh, and this result was achieved by supporting the primary functions of sampling-based planners, sampling and local planning. 
Sampling is supported by projection operation operator that maps unsatisfying samples to satisfying ones, and this can be implemented with you know, gradient descent using the pseudo inverse of the Jacobian of the constraint function. To interpolate while satisfying the constraint, the discrete geodesic is computed, and this is a sequence of constrained satisfying points that are close together. Here is an example of what can be solved with this uh, new um, uh, unifying planner, a, a system with 168 degrees of freedom and 69 uh, constraints. And let me show you an example using Robonaut 2, not in space, but on Earth. This uh, robot is suspended uh, at the NASA Space Station Center in a very special piece of equipment to simulate zero gravity. This work is collaboration with Julia Badger from the NASA Jazz Space Center. Look at these two videos. In one of them, the robot is doing a circular motion. The hand is doing a circular motion to open um, a door. Um, uh, and uh, uh, in the other one, it pushes the door uh, away uh, so that it can get to the next compartment. We'd also like to be able to plan when there is not just one manifold constraint on the system, but when there are many possible constraints on the system. Robonaut 2 could grasp any handrail and in, this, uh, uh, in this module and, and grasp that handrail anywhere along its length. Each grasp is a different manifold constraint and we consider that we consider and are two mass transition constraints, grasping a new handrail and releasing the previous efficiently. But we need to choose what constraints to transition to in order to plan efficiently for these types of problems, and this can be a challenge. Now, a single manifold constraint corresponds to one specific grasp of the handrail. In this problem, we'd like to consider not only one grasp of the handrail, but all grasps of the handrail, where the corresponding constraint is parameterized by their location. So the grasp location is a parameter. Here I will show you the R2 in a variety of valid graphs along the length of the handrail, each of which is a similar manifold constraint. The collection of all grasps on one handrail define a parameterized family of manifold constraints which are continuously related. We call it a mod family. Here is one grasp. Here is another. And here is yet another one. Also, in manipulation and locomotion project, uh, problems such as this one, there isn't just one family of constraints by multiple, but multiple. In this example, R2 can grasp either handrail. Moreover, given all the different families of constraints, here one for each combination of length and handrail, there are only certain transitions allowed. For example, R2 can't just hop with one link to the next handrail, it needs to regrasp with its other link first. In order to search the space efficiently, um, an algorithm has to choose what transitions between constraints to explore. We call this multimodal planning. So, multimodal motion planning finds a path that transitions between modes within mod families. Okay, now the question becomes how to explore possible transitions. Uh, one prior work with multimodal planning was a randomized tree planner by Hauser, and uh, this algorithm explored single mode transitions randomly guided by utility information which was computed offline, and this utility information informed the planner what transitions were promising. Our question is whether a planner could be informed online. So can we, without offline information, guide the planner through multiple transitions so problems with many transitions could be tackled more effectively? The answer is yes, and here is how. Consider a simple multimodal planning problem for a hand rail climbing problem. We abstract the example of R2 to a 2D robot climbing on handrails. The 2D robot is shown on the right, um, uh, and uh, um, it holds one handrail with its right lip. The transition graph for the system is as before, but we add a goal constraint family, which involves placing the torso of the robot within the region labeled as base goal, and this region is shown at the top left of the slide. 
So here at the top right, you can see, uh, you can find an example configuration that would satisfy the goal. This is a realistic scenario for our tool and many mobile manipulators as many times we do not care how the robot gets to a specific location, but we need to have a desired location for the torso, for example, for future manipulation. The contribution of our work is presented, uh, which is presented in this conference, is twofold. First, we estimate the difficulty of planning for any transition online informed by the success or failure of manifold constraint planning. You can see that the planner has estimated that planning near the obstacle is harder than the rest of the bar. Look at the distribution drawn at the top right. The distribution there is over the parameter of the constraint family, and thus information for planning to one transition informs only about parameterizations of the constraint. Here is an example where planners are called to, to influence decisions and not because an exact path is requested. Please remember this point. This is the first example I'm giving you in this talk uh, of planning that is used not to get a path but to inform other decisions. Moreover, the distribution that I showed you, you before is uh, conditional on the incoming parameter, in this case where the right arm is. Here you can see the distribution shown. Um, the, you can see that the distribution shown is a slice of the full 2D distribution, which we can efficiently compute. The second contribution of our paper is using the online distribution of difficulty to inform search. The underlying tree planner is given a sequence of desired transitions based on the lowest cost path to a desired parameterization and mod family. Here, a possible candidate transition sequence is shown, and, and based on the success or failure of this transition, the difficulties uh, um, have uh, more weight added to them, encouraging both exploration and exploitation of information gained for search. Now, let's put it together. We have a general planner for manifold constraints that can change its analyzed strategy depending on what the robot is or does and in a, uh, in a way to move along different modes. This can be pretty powerful. Let me show you some examples. In this video, we have a, a robot, uh, the two-lipped robot actually that we used before, moving using monkey bars. However, the obstacles drawn in black and uh, um, uh, this is a pretty complex task. Um, the video shows that our distributions of the parameters are important as this is a very cluttered environment and it only allows transitions in certain places on the bars. In another video is shown here, our planner can also tackle complex problems that are more akin to task and motion planning. In this video, the purple bar cannot move by itself uh, and the hands can grasp it anywhere along its geometry. Note that the hands must pass the object along the inside of the column due to the geometry and they automatically figure out what they need to regrasp. This is just an illustration of what can be achieved with these techniques and I would encourage you to uh, look for uh, the, the, our paper uh, in this conference. So going back to the map of the talk that I showed you before, I've already transitioned to topic two, task and motion planning. Multimodal motion planning is an instance of task and motion planning. For me, it's a very important one. Note that in this case, the planners are called to discover and help exploit the structure of the problem for an efficient solution. It is an important point, and I will show you more examples of this. Um, there are task and motion planning problems that we cannot solve with the previous approach, importantly the ones that demand an order of temporal operations, such as this one where the robot is asked to put all the cans on the tray and then push the tray. To achieve these tasks that involve many steps, we need to plan both for the task and the motion. In general, we take some description of the task and a model of the robot and the environment. On the one hand, we have task planning. This, is a dis this requires discrete reasoning. On the other hand, we have motion planning. This requires continuous reasoning. For each of these problems, we have efficient techniques. If we were to deal with each of these problems by itself, we would be doing pretty well. But combining them, at least for us, turned out to be a huge challenge. 
And it's not only us who have been working on this problem. There is a lot, there are a lot of people who are trying to get a, a, a good grasp on, on task and motion planning. For, uh, we've tried many different things, but one of the things that has worked is the following. It's what we call a synergistic framework for task and motion planning. In this particular instance, we take the specification as a logic formula, and we take an abstraction on the environment and the robot. And what we do is that we construct a graph. And this graph, I will tell you, is going to be weighted. But at the beginning, it's not weighted. We go from uh, our start to our goal uh, um, configuration, and we find a sequence of steps that need to happen for the mission, the task to be achieved. And each of these steps is implemented with a sampling-based motion planner. If we fail, however, we pass back information to the, the uh, task uh, planning uh, um, level. And we have ways to estimate the motion planning difficulty. This uh, weights our graph again and again until we get a path. And as I told you, this uh, uh, kind of technique has helped us. And look again, this is a, an example where the planner was used indirectly to influence the solution of a larger problem. I will not talk too much about uh, task and motion planning. I would like to zero in into a problem that involves task and motion planning, but also involves a human who works with a robot. This is the third part of my presentation. Here is an example. We need to stack the caps that you see on this picture. We have a robot, we have an energy pound, and we have a human who may decide to help or not with a limited number of actions. This, uh, uh, this problem can be specified as follows. Given a formal specification and a model of possible human robot actions, synthesize a policy that guarantees the specification is satisfied. Notice that we are asking for a policy and not a plan. And notice that we are asking for a guarantee. There are many variations of this problem. You um, may uh, um, make assumptions on the fairness of the whole process. You may have a finite or infinite horizon. Um, uh, the way we tackle this problem is through synthesis. So what is synthesis? Given a specification, a synthesis technique automatically outputs a satisfying behavior. This could be in form of a circuit or a program or a policy. In a reactive system, we have a system that receives input signals, emits output signals, and can change its state. In our setup, what we have is a, um, a system where the human or the environment may act, the robot responds or continues, and this uh, may result in a new state or not. Synthesis techniques actually go back uh, uh, to a uh, church and to the foundations of computer science. And synthesis has been used in many dom robotic domains. I will come back to this uh, problem later. For us, we look at synthesis as a game. The planning domain abstraction are the rules of the game. The task is the winning condition. The policy that guarantees task completion is a strategy that guarantees that the robot wins. And here's an example so that I make it more concrete. In this case, we want to build an arc. And we want to build an arc that has two stacked blocks, let's say two white blocks uh, for one of its supports, two black blocks for the other support, and a black box on the top. Uh, and uh, if uh, uh, the robot goes about uh, building this uh, uh, task, and uh, please uh, look at the uh, first uh, figure in this slide, and then the human uh, does something that uh, should not have happened, right? It prevents the robot from completing the action in the next step. The robot will have to figure out a way on how, what to do in order to complete the task, which is uh, completing the arc as it's shown in the third picture on this slide. Reactive synthesis in robotics has been used by many, but they are, and especially by the group of uh, Hadas Krit Kazit and, and Richard Murray, among many others. And the approaches listed here don't all solve the same type of problems, but it gives you an idea that many people are working on this area. There are two distinguish, distinguishing features in our work. One is that we consider only finite tasks, in contrast with many other existing works on, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, where synthesis focuses on infinite horizon tasks, like, for example, monitoring a warehouse. For this, we use LTLF, a finite tra a trace version of LTL, linear temporal logic, to uh, specify our tasks. 
LTL allows standard Boolean operators as well as temporal operators like next uh, and eventually. For example, um, construct an arc uh, with, let's say, two white blocks as support and one uh, black box on the top can be written using uh, LTLF. A logical specification can be converted to the automaton, and this is by work done in formal methods. This autonomous automaton captures exactly which traces satisfy the task specification. Even for a simple formula, however, that is like the one that I'm showing in this picture, the uh, corresponding automaton is quite large, and actually for LTL and LTLF, the automata construction is done to exponential in the length of the formula. We also uh, um, uh, differ in the way that we do our discrete as, as, uh, uh, abstraction. Um, as uh, if you remember, uh, we need a discrete as, abstraction so that we can reason about the task using synthesis techniques. This abstraction formalizes the problem and allows us to apply existing techniques to our problem. The abstraction is a lossy representation of the real world. We want to guarantee that the set of traces that satisfy the specification in the abstraction is exactly the set of traces that satisfy the specification in the physical world. We present the abstraction as a graph. Part of this may sound familiar from traditional AI planning. The nodes correspond to states and the edges correspond to actions. Here we partition actions between the robot actions in blue and the human actions in yellow. We introduce a cost map to track how much energy each robot action takes in each state. Our initial work relied on a handcrafted assumption, abstraction with estimated cost. Can this be automated? A naive approach would be to calculate the cost of each motion planning query, but this clearly does not scale well. We can take advantage of the fact that some motion planning queries are very similar. Here is again where planning methods can shine. I will not go into all the details, but we can build a roadmap based on the obstacles that are always present, like the table and the self-collision for the example shown in the picture. For calculating costs in the abstraction, we can use the shortest path we can find for different sets of object locations. We start with the shortest path, but we revert to longer paths if intermediate solutions are occupied. So here, the motion planning method aided the development of the automated assumption for solving a a synthesis problem. This is another example that I'm giving you where motion planning is involved, not because a path is needed, but to help in the solution of a larger problem. So keep that again in mind. Now that we have both a task uh, automaton and a discrete abstraction graph, we are ready to solve the synthesis problem. To solve the synthesis problem, we construct a game and we play this game, as I said before, against the human. Here's our overall pipeline for solving the problem. Um, we construct the abstraction uh, graph and uh, we use uh, an existing tool to convert our specification to an automaton. We then take the product of the two and we find the winning strategy by working backwards. That is, we, we use fixed point computation to uh, solve the game. This approach works well for small problems, but it does not scale well. The problem of con constructing an arc uh, that I described before with two white blocks and two uh, black uh, blocks as supports and a black uh, uh, block on the top is a very challenging problem. So we simplify the problem, we remove the energy bound. This is now a more fundamental problem that we want to solve. And uh, uh, because our abstractions were so big, to improve scalability, we looked at recent works in formal methods. And uh, this uh, whole work is in collaboration with uh, my colleague, Moshe Bardi. He actually had shown that symbolic approach to synthesis allows for better scalability. So we start digging. The key improvement in uh, the world, their work comes from a symbolic representation using binary decision diagrams or BDDs. BDDs can compactly represent Boolean functions and set. This slide shows a Boolean function. This is the table in the middle uh, and, uh, and how it can be represented. Uh, um, the slide shows how a Boolean function can be represented compactly by a BDD and the BDD is shown on the right. We can use this representation for the abstraction graph. Symbolic representations make a lot of sense in robotics. Consider this toy example where the robot needs to grab a cylinder. Rather than dealing with all states explicitly, we would like to group equivalent states 
together. Intuitively, we don't need to distinguish which cylinder is grasped in this case. The only state variable we care about is that some cylinder is in the grid. BDDs are, are useful because our game ex exhibits some regularity. If our problem has some repeated structure, it is possible that BDDs can help represent it more efficiently. And indeed, a good BDD representation will encode whether or not any cylinder is grasped using a compact decision diagram. For our, for our task, these states are equivalent. So improving scalability is more, we, we found that improving scalability is more complex than just using a symbolic tool. The approach shown in orange combines the domain and the specification into one formula and solves the synthesis problems for that formula using a symbolic tool. The a memory consumption of such tools, however, is prohibitive for robotics applications. So we need to be very careful and very detailed in robotics. The approach that works is the one that creates a BDD for the planning domain, one for the LTLS specification, and then we take the product and we use fixed point for the computation to solve the game. This is the compositional approach shown in purple and also shown in this slide again. We indeed showed that this approach offers better scalability in terms both of runtime and memory usage. And here is an example where you can see a solution to the problem that I gave you earlier. The human helped by placing the black box on top of uh, um, the other black box, but then it kind of uh, interfered negatively with the task by removing the white block. And uh, the robot was, had a strategy, had uh, knew what to do uh, when this happened, and was managed to complete the arc. Let me play this uh, slide again so that you can um, watch this video uh, one more time. Uh, in and see how the human interferes with the task. In the future, we would like to see symbolic approaches applied to different variations of the problem. This could include versions with actions or setting uncertainty, as well as the quantitative version we discussed at the beginning. We would also like to consider abstractions for problems other than manipulation. Can this be built automatically? Do this problem have regular substructures such that symbolic methods can improve scalability? It remains to be seen. I'm actually going to um, um, wrap up by the part of my talk, which is uh, in uh, robotics. And I offer a few thoughts uh, for your consideration. I think we've made huge progress towards uh, autonomous agents. Clearly, there's no a single solution that, uh, that cuts all. And in my opinion, something that is extremely important as we scale up is how to decompose our problems into meaningful components that can be solved and the solutions can be combined in, a, in an easy and intuitive way. In our work, we've looked at only a part of this problem. So I showed you uh, my, our work in motion planning. We try to improve the components, the motion planning components, for example, planning on constrained manifolds, but then we look beyond the, plan, the parts. I showed you how uh, planning on, motion, uh, on uh, manifolds can lead to, to very interesting multimodal planning by discovering the the, um, let's say, structure of the problem. I showed you how planning can be used not to find paths, but to help in the solution of bigger problems in task motion planning, but also in um, the case where you have a, a human working uh, together with a robot. It is important also to think outside robotics. Uh, we use formal methods. We are looking at uh, symbolic representations. Other people are looking at learning. We have a really difficult problem in front of us, uh, um, uh, building an autonomous or a semi-autonomous uh, agent uh, is a real challenge. I will now um, move to the last part of my talk, which is uh, uh, telling you how the insight we've gained through our robotics work has uh, helped in uh, solving problems in computational structural biology. And there are many people in my group who are working on this problem and I would like to acknowledge them here. Let me show you pictures of molecules. I'm showing you a single protein, a complex of two proteins, and actually I'm showing you a phage, P22. The capsid, just the capsid of this phage, is composed by 40, uh, 420 different proteins. 
systems. So these are extraordinary complex systems compared to what we have in robotics, but uh, they are machines. Structural flexibility and motion are very strongly correlated. This is something I'm not saying this, famous people have said this. Richard Feynman, for example, said, all things are made of atoms and everything, and that everything that living things do can be understood in terms of jigglings and winglings of atoms. Yes, but how? How can we understand how these very, very complex machines work? In uh, our work, we loosely have the following analogy. The joints of our robots become atoms, the links become bonds, configurations become conformations. We do not have gravity or friction to worry about, but we do have energy to worry about. Um, the molecules live in energy fields and they like to be in the valleys of these force fields. Force fields are um, typically used to calculate potential energies it is a collection of terms uh, uh, like the ones that I'm showing you here. For example, uh, we calculate intramolecular um, non-bodic interactions. For example, electrostatic interactions, two positive atoms cannot be too close to each other. Also, uh, intermolecular interactions need to be taken into account, as well as interactions with the solver. The bottom line is that we can characterize a particular conformation with a number, and if this number is low, we say that this uh, model, particular conformation, could be encountered in nature, otherwise not. And here is an example of docking, which is the problem that I will discuss in the remainder of, uh, remainder of this talk. Uh, the molecule on uh, the left is a very famous molecule. It's the HIV1 protease. The active side of that molecule is shown in red, and in green you can see an inhibitor of this particular molecule. Um, the inhibitor sits tightly in the active uh, cavity and inhibits the activity that used to take place in that cavity. Um, this uh, particular uh, protein is involved in the replication of the HIV uh, virus, and if that cavity is blocked, uh, this, is, this protein is kind of a molecular scissors, the molecular scissors don't work and the virus does not replicate. But uh, I went to the protein data bank, which is the repository of all known protein structures, and I could get different inhibitors of this particular molecule. And look at them, they all have a different shape and a different size. Uh, it is impossible that they all fit in the same cavity, and indeed, they do not. Molecules are very flexible, and they change shape to accommodate the different inhibitors. They change shape in order to perform their function. Docking uh, and is uh, the process of finding where, how a ligand molecule sits, in, uh, typically in the cavity of a larger molecule and can be very important. Um, in this example, I'm showing you uh, inhibitors for neuronal signaling, uh, for, for HIV, and uh, uh, for immune uh, response signaling. If the ligand is, is small, um, this is a problem that has been studied a lot in, in the pharmaceutical industry. industry. We are interested in, in uh, um, larger ligands or peptides. They typically have about 30 degrees of freedom. Uh, in contrast, uh, pharmaceutical drugs have three to six degrees of freedom. These ligands are becoming very interesting uh, now because they of their clinically relevant properties, such as antimicrobial activity, cell permeability, and even the ability of targeting tumor cells. Much of our work is with peptides, as the uh, one shown here in red, uh, talking to the human leukocyte antigen receptor, the green molecule. There are more than 10,000 different HLA receptors, and as I will tell you later, this receptor is very important for cancer and immunotherapy. First, I will describe our docking method, which is called APGEN. For several classes of HLA receptors, we know that certain atoms need to be approximately in certain positions. We call these atoms the anchors. In the case where the anchors are known, robotics-inspired methods based on inverse kinematics can be valid. In this slide, um, uh, we first generate, the slide shows that we generate uh, backbone conformations and later we do a full atom reconstruction and minimization and we repeat the scheme again and again until low energy solutions are found. 
You can imagine that we can use much of our knowledge on kinematics and planning for generating the backbone conformations. For many cases, however, for many cases of HLAs, actually, we do not know where the angles are. In that case, we need to fit the flexible thing about it manipulator, like a manipulator-looking ligand in the active sign as shown in this slide. We will consider um, uh, one fragment, we dock the small fragment, then we augment the, uh, the fragment, we adjust the flexibility and the conformation of the molecule uh, for a best fit, uh, both geometric and in terms of energy, and we do this until we dock the whole molecule. We've been fairly successful with our work. We uh, compared our work against uh, known cases. And our method, which we call DING, was able to predict both the backbone and the side chains of peptides presented in what is uh, standard binding modes in the literature. In the bottom, you can see our predicted binding mode, which is in red, and the crystal structure of the same peptide in blue. But what is more important is that uh, because our search is not biased or constrained by a standard conformation, Ding was also able to correctly predict peptides that have unusual binding modes. Here I'm showing a peptide that is an important uh, target for immunotherapy. In fact, our docking work is part of a larger pro project which is done with Gregory Lise from the MD Anderson Can Cancer Center. And let me explain the context of uh, this project. There is a sort of quality control mechanism that is present in almost every cell through which a sample of intracellular proteins is clipped into small peptides which are in turn bound to a specific family of receptors. These are the human leukocyte antigens or HLAs I've been talking about and the resulting peptide HLA complex is displayed on the cell surface as shown on this slide. Through this mechanism, these intracellular peptides are now exposed to immune cells, such as tumor-specific uh, uh, cytotoxic T cells, which will not recognize regular cell peptides. However, the same pathway is also present in tumor cells, which are among, uh, um, which among regular peptides will also present some tumor-specific peptides in red. These unusual peptides will be recognized by tumor-specific T cells, activating the T cell that will kill the cancer. In our work, we are given eluded peptides from a tumor of a specific patient and HLAs of the same patient, and we want to determine which peptides dock to which HLA and examine the structural features of the HLA complex. The combined surface of the peptide docked to the receptor is important for our collaborators. In fact, this effort is part of a huge patient pipeline at MD Anderson. It is amazing uh, how um, personalized immunotherapy works. Uh, our collaborators are dissecting tumors from patients and are designing adoptive T cell transfer or peptide based vaccines. Um, our goal is to contribute just a little bit in this pipeline with the uh, development of computational techniques that will help them understand uh, how uh, peptides, uh, tumor peptides bind to the HLAs of a particular patient. And this is the end of my talk. I uh, touched on two uh, topics that I'm very, very excited about. In robotics, we work on the development of human-centered assistive devices. In structural computational biology, we work on computational modeling and the analysis and the design of new therapeutics. Um, I have not done all this work by myself. I have been extremely lucky over the years to work with very talented students. I acknowledge my current group here and several students who really have shaped the work that we do today in our lab. I acknowledge our collaborators and all the sources of our current work. And at this point, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.